everyone, and welcome to Inside Indie. And today we're going to talk about getting old. And, uh, you know, I'm not being negative about it because I'm already there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the elderly, seniors in our community, um, helping them, supporting them. We have two uh, experts in the studio today with us, Carol Applegate. You are a registered nurse and elder law attorney yes. here mm -hmm. in, is it Indianapolis? Or are you based in Indianapolis? I'm in Carmel. You're yes. in Carmel. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And then we have Lisa Dillman. You are an elder law attorney and managing partner of Applegate and Dillman Elder Law, right? Yes, Kelly. Welcome to Inside Indy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, mm, I have a lot of good questions for you ladies. First of all, we, 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 we say senior citizens, we say the elderly, elder. But when does that begin? Because when I was growing up, it would be 65, but now you get your AARP card like at 50. <laughs> so who are the elderly? And, and what does that really mean? How do, you, how do you define when you've reached that point? Well, I always say it's, it's, there's not a special mm -hmm. date. There's not a special age that okay. we, be, we begin aging when we, when we first are born. So, mm -hmm. um, but we're seeing, uh, you know, families, we really want our families to start planning and looking at some issues early on. That's mm. right. I usually think uh, mid-50s is mm -hmm. a time to revisit um, any sort of estate plan you have, and then we can start talking about what the next 20, 25, 30 years would look like from a planning perspective. Um, the last thing you want to do is have to deal with a medical diagnosis or a medical crisis and then figure out, oh, we should have been thinking about mm -hmm. these things earlier. Okay. It okay. doesn't mean we always have to act on mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. but we right. at least have to, you know, at least plan. Okay. okay. So for some options. So let's talk about what Applegate and Dillman Elder Law, what you do, mm -hmm. and the various services that you offer to the elderly. Mm -hmm. Sure. Go ahead, Carol. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we um, we do a lot of estate planning. Okay. We do guardianships. Um, in my office, we do what we call life care planning. Life and, care planning. Mm -hmm. okay. And so that's really developing a relationship with these families and clients and plan for a lifetime. So all the things that can happen as they age, as they go through this journey of aging, there's a lot of things that can change very quickly. And so life care um, actually gives them services throughout their lifetime. Okay. So walk me through some of the services that um, you would share with me if I were to come in. And let's say I'm 25, and I know that probably doesn't happen often mm -hmm. because, you know, the 25-year-olds never think they're going to get old, right? right, right. But, mm -hmm. but take me on that journey. Well, we, in, in my office and in what uh, Lisa will be doing in the future as well is to, we really look at four issues, and that's your health. Okay. You know, what is your health? How are you, uh, you know, do you have any chronic illnesses? We also look at where you're living, and if you do have illness, where what kind of care might you need in the future? Yeah. We always look at your financial situation because we always know that um, in facilities uh, or if you're needing care in the home, it is gonna be costly. And so therefore we wanna make sure that your finances, where are your finances at this point? Where, the, where might they be in the future? And then uh, lastly, are there any public benefits that might help pay for some of that care as you go through this process. Mm, okay, so when it comes to public uh, benefits, Lisa, what is what is out there? What's available? Sure, sure. a lot of people um, need a little bit more information about the difference between Medicare and Medicaid, for instance. Uh, veterans benefits. There's a lot of health coverage and prescription coverage that'll, that people may qualify for and they don't even know it. Mm. So one of the things that we do is we do a lot of assessments, not only financial and legal, but also kind of holistic assessments on are you still safe in your home? Do you have enough care um, in in place? Do you, are there resources that we could help you connect with, even if it's a simple home modification that could keep you safer in the bathroom or in the garage? So what I love about the practice that we're putting together is that it's legal, financial, but also medical and social in many ways. Okay. So pretty much you guys have worked independently and you've come together. Mm -hmm. And why join forces? 
Well, I, I want to answer that because Carol, uh, Carol's practice was doing something that I didn't see in the elder law space and we weren't doing it in the elder law space and that's that holistic approach that I just kind of mentioned. Mm -hmm. So um, we have registered nurses on staff that once um, a, a life care planning client retains us, they go to the home, they meet with the family, they they counsel on things like grief and grieving and, uh, and stress stress and anxiety, things that you don't really hear from a lawyer <laughs> very right. much. Yeah, so that's yeah, what I really love about the practice. Yeah, yeah. because I was going to say, Carol, uh, you're a registered now nurse and elder law attorney. Mm -hmm. Now explain how that happened, <laughs> because that's pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. Yes. Well, it was always just a, a personal goal for myself to, to go on to law school. And at one point, I didn't know exactly how that was going to work together. But I have found in elder law, the, that care piece, uh, you know, taking care physically and mentally of our clients is so, so important. And that nursing background is invaluable when mm -hmm. we're dealing with families. And many times there's a crisis or they get a diagnosis or something goes wrong in the nursing home. And that nursing background and the, the expertise of a nurse is so helpful with helping families. Wow. Yeah, that... It really guides that that. I think it really guides the ship here, you know, where you're, what, what kind of care. Uh, many of our families will say, I, I, they're not worried about finances, they're not worried, but they're worried about the care that mom's going to get, mom and dad are going to get, mm -hmm. or where can mm -hmm. we, what facility can we place them so that they're going to have good care. Okay. So care is so important. Okay, well, that's very impressive, though, and it's very unique. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you, you, mm -hmm. you stand out <laughs> among the rest, I'll say that, right. mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. for right. sure. Now, you mentioned Medicaid and Med Medicare. Mm -hmm. Explain the differences between the two because sure. it throws me even to this day when I hear people say it. I don't, I, I don't know why I can't retain that, but I don't know what one means or the, the other, one versus mm -hmm. the other. Sure. So Medicare is a federal benefit that one is entitled to to help pay for health care after age 65 or if one becomes disabled. So those coverages through Medicare, sometimes people hear Medicare Part A, Part B, Part D. Those, those coverages can cover things um, like hospital stays. It will cover um, doctor's visits, even some prescriptions perhaps. But what a lot of people think is once they land in a nursing home or an assisted living that Medicare is there to help pay for the care they receive there. Not true. Mm. <laughs> so that's where we start looking for other things to help, like um, Medicaid, for instance, which is available for long-term care for those over 65. Um, there are also veterans benefits available to not only veterans, but their spouses, even their children sometimes. So we find that the first couple meetings is all about education and uh, investigation. What, what is available to these families? And many families don't know what they have. That's exactly right. They will say, well, I think I have a supplemental plan, mm -hmm. but they're not certain. So why don't we know? And what have you found when you deal with clients? Why we have no clue? Right. <laughs> My only answer is um, our culture, our society, uh, tends to be youth-centric. We, we educate a lot about how to help our youth, how to raise our children. And a lot of times, seniors and the elderly get a little forgotten. Mm -hmm. So that that education message isn't in everyone's face. Um, not that it's not as important, it absolutely is. And that's, I guess that's what Carol and I wanna do, and that is get people information, um, mm -hmm. because it's just not as readily available. And there's not as, there's so many options out there, mm -hmm. you know, and they mm -hmm. get so bombarded with information that they're not certain how to, how to proceed. Okay, um, so let's, Use me as I'm, I'm a new client. I've I've come to your practice, and I may not even really know what I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so how would you work with me? Because I'm in my fifties. Don't tell anybody. That. <laughs> I'm in my. <laughs> I'm not gonna say how high up in the fifties. <laughs> but um, I, so I come to see you. What, what's the first thing you do? Let's kind of walk me through it. Well, I I think the first thing is we really do a full assessment okay. as to where are you right now. Mm -hmm. What you know? What documents do you have in place? What mm. documents do you need? Um, where are, where are your finances? How are how are your? Do you own a home? Do you have investments? Uh, and then do any you have a will? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right. And and so your finances. And then are you? Do you have any health issues? Mm -hmm. You know because um, chronic illness is very very uh, 
prevalent and it's also very costly. Mm. So we really want to get a good assessment, sort of a snapshot of where you are today. Okay. And what are your goals for the future? You know, we always want to see where, where would you like to go as mm -hmm. we proceed. Okay, okay. Well, as you were saying that, it was kind of scary because I guess I really don't think about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It uh -huh. is one and of those. And don't want to think about right. it. Most people do not want to. It's right. not one of those subjects that you sit down and say, okay, let's, right. let's talk about this. Um, and so uh, families are hesitant sometimes mm -hmm. to really face, or it's, it's one of those things that we think that's never going to happen to us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to ever have to face that. Yeah. Or you, at least you hope you don't. Yes. But, uh, mm -hmm. but I do say in my mind sometimes, like, what if I get sick, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just scary. And I, I, I don't have children, so I think that's the scariest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. part for me is uh, mm -hmm. who's going to take care of you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's how a lot of uh, families find us, through their adult children who have maybe come home for the holidays or something, and they've seen, haven't seen mom or dad for maybe six months, and then they see this huge decline, either mobility or cognitively, mm -hmm. and then we'll get, mm -hmm. we'll get the phone call. Hey, can, can we come in and talk about mom or dad's plan? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just got a couple of minutes left. Uh, in fact, three minutes left. What would you say are the, the greatest challenges that the elderly population face? Oh, I say it's finding the right care. care mm -hmm. Caregivers, it's, you know, it's decreasing. There's not enough people to care for our elderly. And then I would say the cost. Cost. The cost and, of care. Yeah, and I think it's also the access to resources and information. Mm -hmm. I, I really think that's an inherent problem. People don't know what they don't know. What to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And there's a shortage of caregivers as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, both um, in the homes and in facilities. It's, there's okay. just not enough people. There's a nursing shortage, and so there's just not enough people to take care of these, mm -hmm. our elderly. Mm -hmm. Okay. If people want to get in touch with you and, and take advantage of your services, I tell you, you've got me thinking. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's our job. We need to do that. Right. So how would they get in touch with you? Sure. They can uh, call 317-492-9569, and then we can get you patched into whatever team could help you the quickest. Or you could do uh, DillmanLawGroup.com, and that will get, us, get you an, uh, an appointment with Carol or myself, um, and just for education, just for information. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, get it, get it going. Carol Applegate, mm -hmm. uh, uh, registered nurse and elder law attorney, and Lisa mm -hmm. Dillman, elder law attorney and managing partner, uh, partner for Applegate and Dillman Elder Law. Thanks so much <laughs> for joining us on Inside Indy. Thank Thanks, you. Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. And we'll be back with more here on Inside Indy after this. I understand. I know it's not your typical resume. Okay, well. But candidate. But I've been working double shifts just to pay for books. I've been raising my two little brothers. I'm determined, driven, motivated. Isn't that what you're looking for? Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. We're back here on Inside Indy, and in this segment, we're going to talk about the game plan, meaning the base. Success lives here. Uh, base Indy, Indianapolis. We're still trying to decide that, <laughs> but here to help us decide that is Robert Barber. They call you Rob. They do. Okay, and you're the executive director of Base Indianapolis. Welcome to Inside Indy. Thank you for having me, and uh, yes, they do call me Rob, and it's... The base, uh, the base indie. So. All right. So, what is base indie and the game plan? Game plan. Uh, about a year ago, uh, a program that started in Boston that uh, was from the the program's founder about I guess about five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, he came from a gang intervention program with the Boston Foundation, and then he was challenged to leave there and to start this program. And so, it took kids that were underserved in the uh, urban community and gave them an opportunity using baseball as an incentive uh, and softball to bring them uh, to the program where we provided educational access, tutoring, 
sort of wraparound services, classes, and things like that. But it uh, didn't cost him anything, so he raised the money within the community and then allowed him uh, to be able to provide a channel and access for them for jobs and education. So the first group that I met a few years ago, all of those kids went to college for free, uh, not on wow. athletic scholarships, but on academic and need-based scholarships. Wow. Yeah, okay. isn't that cool? Okay, very cool, very cool. So why baseball? Why using baseball as the mechanism to, to reach the kids? Yeah, he, he had a football background. He uh, played and his brother played for the Patriots. And so, um, but some 13-year-olds some, uh, when he was 18 said, we need a coach for their baseball team. And so he coached for years before that uh, with, the, with uh, these young people. And then in my background, I ended up, uh, and I played it at uh, IU. And so it'd been my career throughout. And so that was the thing that brought us on a field at Heritage Christian and uh, kind of looking at each other and getting to know each other and watching them uh, play. And so that's just the passion point for us. Mm -hmm. I think what we found is that uh, it's now in Chicago and here, it's that we all have a passion about something and things that are passionate, we're passionate about, we tend to be more committed to. You know, we withstand the, the ups and the downs, particularly the downs, you know, and we're willing to get up one more time and to keep fighting and to go through. And so it means something mm -hmm. to us. And so baseball, I think, is just the first place. In Chicago, there's dance and uh, they just launched uh, hoops there, but it's really the, the core program and it's any, it could be any passion point. Okay, okay, okay. So the game plan, the game being, it could vary. It could, yeah. Right. It could. Okay, wow, pretty cool. So now tell me how it works here in Indianapolis, what, what you offer, how do kids get involved? Um, so if I am a parent and I've got a 10 year old, I, I'm, I'm you know, uh, in an urban situation, how do you tell me what I need to do to get my kid involved? Sure. Uh, part of uh, our process now is we're raising money to, um, uh, to lease a facility. We've got a, a site I'd mentioned earlier that's around 25th and Sherman. There's a strip mall mm -hmm. there that we're going to go into. Uh, and it's raising funds to be able to, to take over that. It's about 11,000 square feet. Uh, where folks can access us, they can go to thebaseindy.org. And uh, they can contact me through there and, and ask for some more information. On the site are some videos, which are extremely well done, and tell a little bit more about the story of the base and uh, some of the folks that have been involved. It's cool. One of the things that attracted me initially was when I saw that the Red Sox were involved, and Sam Kennedy, and Theo Epstein, and then the Cubs. And then I'm at Fenway Park and at Wrigley Field. And so I realized. And then I go to an event, and the first one that's there, I meet the governor of the Commonwealth, Charlie Baker, and then I meet Marty Walsh, the, uh, the mayor of Boston. And so the folks that are around and support this uh, have really been, uh, have, have moved this uh, forward. And so when we looked at Indianapolis, we thought this is a great place to be able to uh, create that. And it's been the case because we have the support of the Indians and Strata Education. Mm -hmm. So if folks want to get involved with us, uh, the, probably the website. And, uh, and what we would provide here is just uh, a different, depending on their age. So at a younger age, it mm -hmm. uh, may be just as they're revving up for their little league season, mm -hmm. they may come in and be able to get around some of the uh, instructors and the coaching we have. So we have an indoor instructional facility. Okay. Um, and then we will also go out into the, uh, the league. So we worked with like Douglas Little League. We've been out to, uh, to their facility. But that's, um, that's kind of our initial game plan is to bring people in. Most of the kids that we're going to do the most, uh, uh, the work with the most depth will be uh, and have the most benefit will probably be high school and middle school kids. Okay. Okay. Now, how many kids are you able to support at one time to work with? Yeah, we initially planned to have, uh, and just in the short time that we started, so we launched here the game plan in April, and that was uh, at, uh, mm -hmm. throughout the summer, we have uh, about 35 kids that uh, we've connected with, and we expect that to grow to about 100, because uh, we really didn't do a whole lot to get those kids. We have a relationship with a program here that Mill Thompson had founded called mm -hmm. um, Play Ball Indiana that runs an RBI program. Uh, here and so they run six different leagues in Indianapolis and so they're a feeder system for us and so mm -hmm. as those young people get a little bit older um, we have uh, some instruction we can provide some opportunities for them to continue to play and to continue to advance because in baseball that's a place where African-American young people have just fallen completely off mm. and uh, the number of African-Americans playing baseball uh, has been declining for uh, a number of years 
And so Major League Baseball recognizes that, and they feel like that uh, there's such a rich history with the Negro Leagues, mm -hmm. and particularly in Indianapolis with the Indianapolis Clowns, mm -hmm. that uh, that's one of the things that opened the door for us in Martindale Brightwood in the community uh, that we're currently anchored. Wow, okay, okay, and I guess, you know, being in Indiana, this is the, you know, there's Hoosier hysteria, so you have the <laughs> right. basketball thing. Right. So, yep, yeah, probably gets the, you know, the, the right. There's people that go, most why? love sport in Indiana. So That's right. <laughs> I can see That's where. the part where people ask, say, why baseball? Here, we don't even have a major league team. So, well, we've got, we're a major league city, and mm -hmm. we have a major league, minor league team with the Indianapolis Indians. Right. Here and so they've been, you know, tremendous. But Indianapolis, anything we've done, and that's been that's really played out true, and it's made a big impression with the folks in Boston. Is that Indianapolis just exceed, particularly when it comes to amateur sports, and when the community buys in, that it's really some extraordinary things happen, uh, both from events and from uh, organizations that have, uh, you know, planted here. And so the support in the time that I've been here has just been has been really terrific. Okay. I know a friend of mine who used to play for the Indians, and I was just thinking maybe he'd like to get involved and help you guys with some of your efforts. Uh, I don't know if you remember him, Dallas Williams. He was. Yeah. I know Dallas, and he and I just texted, and mm -hmm. he is going to be here because, um, yeah, so I've known Dallas for okay, a, okay. a while, and he will be uh, involved, and I just sent him a note. It wasn't even uh, a week ago. I shot it to him and okay. go, hey, man, just so you know this is coming up, and he said, outstanding, I'll be there. Okay, cool, cool. I'm good friends with his wife, Teal. Oh, okay. Uh, Williams, Rivers Williams. Yeah. She's a broad ripple grad, too, everybody. Hey! <laughs> Go Rockets. Anyway, that's what I I coached his son, too, by the way. Dallas oh, third. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Okay. Oh, yeah. Great kid. Great. Oh, man. Oh, isn't? <laughs> like a family man. He's just, oh, it's just awesome. So, yeah. now what tools do, that do you have within the organization to help kids? And what are some of the things they experience beyond the, the, the actual game? It's a great question. The... Uh, so we came into the, the community here. I wasn't sure where we were going to end up. I was driving up and down last July, up and down Sherman, and I really looked at a heat map and say, where's the most activity for, uh, and for that point, sort of crimes in Indianapolis, okay. and said, there's really about three or four areas that are priorities, and this was one. And so, but I wasn't sure where we were going to land. Well, through a series of events uh, and a relationship, uh, I was introduced to uh, Tysha Sellers, at uh, Edna Martin Christian Center. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they are anchored right there, provide all kinds of wraparound services from counseling to after school care to elder uh, activities. And they just uh, launched uh, KIPP Academy down there. And so they're a partner for us to be able to access their partnerships and to work with them in the educational zone and the in city of Indianapolis because that 25th Street corridor between the Monon and Sherman is now a priority for you know, redevelopment. Right. And so we're working with, uh, you know, with Taisha. And so that's a big part of um, uh, what we're going to do. Okay. How we're going to provide. Okay. Now, you have a big event coming up in November. Let's talk about that. We do. We have an event. Um, one of the things I found in Boston, they do just a terrific job of, that I didn't understand as a baseball, coming out of the baseball world, is why they have so many events. <laughs> why there's so many things going on. It's like there's a, Women's leadership breakfast they have that's gets terrific, all done very well. But um, as I went to these events and kept showing up, whether it's in Chicago or Boston, um, that I understood that uh, they were telling a story, and they were mm -hmm. talking about this journey, and they were celebrating the success of the kids, and it was incredibly compelling. When you see kids that others in the world would say at risk, we don't see them that way. We see them mm -hmm. as just kids that didn't have opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we provided those, helped provide those opportunities. The kids took advantage, did the work, and now they're celebrating and they're going to college. And we're having university presidents come back and say, these uh, young people from the base came to our university. We were so impressed with them. We're here tonight to announce that we're going to offer four scholarships a year for the next four years for your young people. Wow. And so this event is really for us is part of telling that story. Um, we're hosting it at the uh, Salesforce has been generous to, to allow us to be in the Ohana room, which is on the 47th floor, the highest point in Indiana. And wow. so okay. um, a lot of the relationships with that, that we've had uh, in Indianapolis with a, a scout that's a friend of mine, Mike Farrell, that's going to be working with us. Uh, he and I have worked, and uh, so we have a number of major league players, current major league players, mm -hmm. and former players 
players like Dallas mm -hmm. that will be at this event to be able to say we're supporting this and we're behind this program. So Robert and the staff will be in from Boston and up there. And so it'll be part fundraiser, part telling the story, part celebrating, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the bases, uh, uh, you know, launch here in Indianapolis. Okay. We just got about a minute to go. And a real quick question. A lot of people may say, why, wh why do you do this? And, and, and I, I, I'll just put it bluntly like, What's this white guy doing? What, why do you do this? Okay. The, like. I asked that same question to Robert. You know, at the same time, I go, you know, I'm white, right? Going into the city, and you know, how's that? And uh, and he was he was great. He said, you know, sometimes that people look at him as an African American and say, you know, you need to go solve your own problem with the people, get control mm -hmm. of what's going on in there. And he said, sometimes he said, I found it's uh, important when you find uh, a person that, that's uh, a white that can go into the community and say we've left some folks behind, we've left some young people behind, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's all of our responsibilities to be able to pitch in and to help uh, provide some opportunities and access for them. And so I've appreciated that uh, he's included me and we've, uh, we've had those conversations and laugh and, and uh, do, but I, okay. I've had more than a couple people look at me and go, trying to connect the dots. Okay, okay. no, but it's a good dot, so. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, thank you so much, Robert Barber, Executive Director of Base Indy, for joining us here on Inside Indy. We've got your information on the screen if people have questions. Yes, absolutely. And beyond. Thank All you, right. Kelly. Thank appreciate you that doing. so much. Appreciate thank you. It. And we appreciate you for watching. I'm Kelly Vaughn. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Dear America, when you look at me, what do you see? Do you see me for who I am? Or just where I'm from? Can you see my dedication and commitment? Talent that's waiting to better our country with the amazing things we will accomplish. Talent that lies within the heart of every urban community. So America, when you look at me, do you know what you should see? Your future.